Sunday after Epiphany. If she looked at your news and notes, I want to highlight a couple of things here. And one of them is the youth is sell, uh, selling their usual annual submarine sandwiches for Super Bowl. And you'll be able to get that uh, in the narthex. Also, they're uh, putting together a food drive, too. You can see those blue containers that are out there. That has to do with the food drive they're uh, putting together. And I guess there's a competition between teams. And uh, anyway, I guess from your favorite team, you put your food in your favorite team on the final. All right. Also, uh, today is the beginning. Well, this week we're going to be celebrating Lutheran Schools Week. And for that reason, we're going to have uh, Principal John Weber come up and address you and talk to you a little bit about what's happening at Central Lutheran School. And if you can make sure that the, I'm thinking about the volume on the lectern. If you can push that up, if it's not up already. Good morning. Is that not working? No. Oh. Only a teacher. I don't have a teacher voice anymore. I've been out of the classroom too long. So, anyway, uh, thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to, to speak this morning. Um, as, as Pastor mentioned, this is the beginning of National Lutheran Schools Week. Central is a part of a large network of schools that get to share the message of Jesus with students from preschool and even younger than that all the way through college. And, and so we are very blessed to be a part of that ministry, but, but more so, we are an extension of the ministry here at Emmanuel. And it, that's a, a great ministry to the community of, of New Haven, Fort Wayne, and, and the surrounding area. We are humbled and honored to be a part of this ministry with you. And uh, we want you to know that Central Lutheran School is, is here for you. I would love to have opportunity to speak with you sometime about uh, your vision of, of the ministry here and to share with you what the vision is for Central Lutheran School. And uh, I would also love to show you the building and, and take you on a tour if you haven't been there for a while. Uh, so consider this an invitation to stop in and see me sometime over at school. Our mission statement says that Central Lutheran School is a caring, loving, sharing family of Christians dedicated to Christ-centered education, cultivating lifelong learning, and for joyful service to the church, the community, and the world. We're honored to share in that mission with you and to be a part of Emmanuel Lutheran Church. We pray that we can be a blessing to you as you have been a blessing to us. Thank you for your support, your gifts of time, talent, and treasure, and for all that you do for Central. Thank you, John.
Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made the record. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children, and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way. 
God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.
short, and then he finishes with, for the present uh, form of this world is passing away. The present form of this world. This world is passing away. And if you compare it to eternity, the time is always what? Very, very short. Uh, and when we get to the gospel lesson, you have Jesus doing something quite interesting. He's speaking about what he always speaks about, and that is the kingdom, his kingdom, the kingdom that is to come, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And he's really taking the mantle from John the Baptist. You notice John the Baptist is now in prison, but John would say this was basically his message. The kingdom of God is near, repent and be baptized. And so when Jesus begins his ministry, he says the exact same thing that John does. And he says, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near or at hand. I think it's a better translation. It is at hand. And therefore, uh, repent and believe uh, the good news. Believe the gospel. So he's saying the same thing. He's always saying that. You notice Jesus is always saying the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like. And he would always say a parable. He always is interested in telling you what the kingdom of God is like, and it's in contrast to the kingdoms that you know. And this is a theme in scripture that goes right from the beginning, and you can find various ways in which you can find this. It's really quite incredible. When we did our uh, study on Isaiah and Isaiah, it really came to light to me what Isaiah was saying in regards to kingdoms come, kingdoms go. But the kingdom of God remains. And if you look into the Old Testament, I think the good visual would be going to the book of Daniel, where the king of Babylon, one of the great kingdoms, uh, is, uh, has a dream and he wants it interpreted. And the dream went this way. I saw a statue. And the statue, the head was gold, the breast was silver, then bronze, and then the feet were iron, and it turned up a mix of iron and clay at the foundation. Iron and clay at the foundation is not a good foundation, is it? Okay? And uh, the dream goes where uh, there is a large boulder that's hewn out of a mountain, and uh, it smashes at the feet this statue, and the statue comes tumbling down. And Daniel interprets the dream for Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, that head of gold, that's you, that's Babylon. But after you will come the Medo-Persians, and after the Medo-Persians will come the Greeks, and after the Greeks will come the Romans. It's very interesting. Where was Jesus? What kingdom, what earthly kingdom was happening when Jesus was around? It was the Roman kingdom, wasn't it? And they were oppressing the people of God. They were oppressing everybody for their power. And the hewn rock smashes the statue at that feet. And then grows and grows through eternity. So what I want in your head right now as I preach this sermon is emerging from the rubble of all kingdoms is Jesus Christ. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. There has never been an earthly kingdom that survives. When you think about the kingdom, what does it do? If, if you were to become the great kingdom of the world, you what? You defeat your enemies. You defeat the weak people. And you rise in power. And when you're rising in that power, what do you believe about yourself? Nobody is going to take my power away. But it always does. You go into the Bible, you've got the Hittites, the Geridites, the, the, the Geridites, the Amorites, the Amalekites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Midianites, the Jebusites, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Philistines, and I can go further. And then the grand kingdoms are the kingdom of, remember, Egypt? Where's Egypt now? It's in Africa. It's a country in Africa. Egypt was probably the most mighty kingdom that ever lived thousands of years ago. The mighty, long-lasting power of Egypt. And they've got Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. Post-Jesus, what do you have? The Byzantine Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire, the Chinese Empire, the Soviet Union, the United States of America Empire. They all come and they all go. And the Bible makes a very strong point about this. If you go into the Old Testament, you could actually look into 
uh, Moses. Moses writing in Genesis Ham. Remember Ham? He's one of the three sons of Noah. He's the one who uh, exposed his father's shame after his father got drunkenly naked and he exposed it and his other brothers covered up. And Ham was cursed from Ham to come the Canaanites, says in the scriptures. Lot. Lot is the nephew of Abraham. He has two children by his daughters. They become, through those sons, the Moabites and the Ammonites, both thorns in the side of Israel, the great kingdom that God chooses to be his own. And then if you think about Israel itself, God says, I will make a nation out of you, Abraham, and the nation of Israel comes. And the nation of Israel has its high point when King David, what does King David do? He does exactly what all other kings do. Destroys the nations around, subdues them, and he becomes this great nation. And God always said, from Judah will come something. And what happens with the great nation of Israel? Well, down the road, the Assyrians will come, wipe out the northern tribes of Israel. There's going to be the split, and the split happens after Solomon. And then you got the Babylonians putting the people of Judah into exile, but the people get to return because God makes a promise that from Judah will come the kingdom. Isn't that interesting? Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. Jesus shows up on the scene, and he's got the entire Old Testament history and the entire Old Testament prophecy speaking of kingdoms. And lo and behold, I went back to Isaiah just to remind myself of what we studied. And let me just give you some things that Isaiah said in about the 7th century B.C. when he speaks of uh, prophecy against Babylon. Well, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Mighty powerful nations, every man's heart will melt. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty, and listen, and will humble the pride of the ruthless. Prophecy against the Philistines, chapter 14. Just a few verses. There's a bunch of it here, but I don't have that much time. Look what he says in regards to uh, uh, the Philistines. He condemns the Philistines, the nation, and then he says, the poorest of the poor, listen, the poorest of the poor will find pasture, and the needy will lie down in safety. Okay? But your root I will destroy. Moab, Cush, Egypt, Edom, Arabia, and then the prophecy against Jerusalem itself. Now, Jerusalem is the city of God, but the people of God, this is the point I want you to understand, the people of God were ruthless too. They became deceitful in their power. Chapter 22, verse 4, what does the Lord say to Jerusalem? Turn away from me. Let me weep bitterly. Do not try to console me over the destruction of my people. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, has a day of tumult and trampling and terror in the valley of the vision, a day of battering, battering down walls and of crying in the mountains, and he goes on and on with that. But then you get to chapter 32. And there's a little bit of a change here. What does it say in chapter 32? And it has to do with the king of righteousness coming from where he was supposed to come from according to the word of God. See, a king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. Each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm. And lo and behold, he's speaking about the one who now shows up in the gospel lesson after John saying the kingdom is what? Right here. The kingdom of God is now here in the person of Jesus Christ, prophesied from the very beginning of time. But you see, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Earthly kingdoms do, but from the rubble, dear friends, from the rubble of arrogant kingdoms 
looking for power and might, will rise the kingdom that lasts forever. Earthly kingdoms have come and gone. They are established through might and conquering of other nations. They arise because of strength and they fall because of weakness. They suppress their captors and those in power, be it a king or a magistrate or any other governing body, for the pursuit of dominance. But they fall because of their arrogance. What am I getting at here? Well, this is a theme of Scripture. This is a theme of Scripture. How are you feeling today in the contemporary world? Are you bothered by government? Are you bothered by what's going on in our world? Are you worried? And in that worry, are you so overwhelmed by it that you forget the fact that your citizenship is in heaven. How many of you believe that the Constitution of the United States is one of the greatest documents ever put together? Raise your hand. Me too. How many of you think that the United States of America is the greatest nation that ever lived? Raise your hand. I do too. How many of you pray for your country? Are you praying really hard right now? I will talk to you. I visit with you. You come to see me. And people are very, very discouraged about our country. They're worried about where it's going. They're worried about the division. And because we have the fourth petition, where the great Martin Luther says, Give us this day our daily bread it has to do with praying for all those things that we have that are temporary, including good government. Pray for your nation, absolutely, for all the reasons why you're thinking. But don't turn it into your idol. Don't make this nation your greatest hope, because it's not. This is a lesson I'm learning. And as I look in the scripture and I see what the Savior of the world says, I am the kingdom and it is here. I am the kingdom and this kingdom is put together completely opposite the way all earthly kingdoms are put together. This kingdom of God, which is through Jesus Christ, is one in which the king doesn't conquer others. The king gets conquered by Rome. The king gets conquered, conquered by Jerusalem and is put on a cross and he dies for the sins of the whole world. And therein he establishes the eternal kingdom through death and then through resurrection. And God says, you are a citizen of this kingdom that has no end, that's established through grace and mercy and humility of God. Confirmed by Christ, established by Christ, is in fact the Christ who dwells with us in bread and wine in just a moment, where you get to consume the kingdom of God, which is yours forever. So Jesus says what? The kingdom is near. What do we do? Repent. Repent of what? Maybe I need to repent of all those things I put my trust in, as I elevate them as if they're my most important trust, my strongest trust. Maybe I need to confess to God that I have not put the kingdom of God first in my life. And I'm overwhelmed with a terror that I ought not to be overwhelmed by because Christ is with me each and every day, leading me home to the kingdom that he promised. For the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Jesus says, repent, turn away. In other words, turn away from all other hopes elsewhere for your eternal security. And believe, listen, he's saying, trust in the good news. And I know for sure that you and I will look back from eternity to this day, and we will rejoice forever 
knowing that all earthly kingdoms have passed away. But Christ's kingdom is forever, and we will be forever in that kingdom with our Lord and Savior Jesus. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all of our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Having heard God's word, let us confess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, for all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God. Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of every God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things are made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and on the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and His Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and solid church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you desire not the death of a sinner, but that all would repent and believe the good news. In the epiphany of your Son, your time of salvation and your kingdom have come near. It's near now. And as this world passes away, give faithfulness and urgency to your church to proclaim the gospel of our God to all people. Eternal Lord, in view of every current distress at the present form of this world passing away, give constancy and contentment to your people in their God-given stations. Give comfort and faithfulness to the married and strengthen them to pass the faith on to the next generation and show kindness also to the unmarried and assure them of the holiness of their place in life that they would be free from anxiety and attend to holiness in body and spirit. Merciful Father, turn us from every distracting anxiety and the dealings of this world that would draw our hearts away from your blessed gospel and its end, eternal life. Give us confidence in the resurrection and the peace of a clean conscience by the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. Graciously behold and help those who struggle this day. We especially pray for Jim Hargins, Don Ballmeyer, Nancy Burkhalter, Verdine Kuhneman, Ed O'Regan, Stephanie Shaley, who is the uh, uh, daughter-in-law of Roger and Jane Shaley. Grant them peace that passes all understanding to the family and friends of Logan Bauer and the family and friends of Marlene Edwards, who is the mother of Kathy Mackey, who have been called to their eternal home. May the wonderful news of the resurrection of Christ and our resurrection in Christ guide them through the hope that will never fail us. Gracious Lord, in your holy sacrament, you deliver the gospel proclaimed by your Son, and which was won by his death, be it his true body and blood. Work repentance and faith in all of us as we commune and unite them in a sincere confession of your divine truth at this altar. All these things and whatever else you know that we need. Grant us faith for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace.